Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We will get started in about two minutes. Again, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We will be starting very shortly. Thank you all very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, Governor Mills. My name is Nirav Shah. I'm the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and I am delighted this afternoon to be joined by Governor Mills, as well as Commissioner Heather Johnson, the Commissioner of Maine's Department of Economic and Community Development. Governor Mills, Commissioner Johnson, and I are here today to provide an update on the COVID-19 situation across the state of Maine for today, Friday, June 12th. 2020. I'll provide an update as to where things stand from the epidemiology perspective and then turn things over to Governor Mills. Overall, across the state, Maine CDC is reporting now 2,721 cases of COVID-19 statewide, an increase of 54 cases since yesterday. Of those 54 cases, 40 are laboratory confirmed and 14 are probable cases. Overall, 308 individuals have been hospitalized at some point, 
and 32 individuals are currently in the hospital, an increase of three people since yesterday. Of those 32 individuals, 11 are in the ICU and five are on ventilators. Overall, there have been 100 individuals across the state of Maine who have passed away with COVID-19 and 2,105 who have recovered, an increase of 43 since yesterday. Of our cases, 683 are among healthcare workers. The increase of cases of 54 is a, is a step up from what we've seen in recent days. Maine CDC epidemiologists are undertaking the process of investigating each and every one of those cases to determine whether if any are linked to known outbreaks or whether any might represent new outbreaks. As that investigation and those investigations continue, we'll continue to have updates across the state uh, during these briefings. I'd like to provide a quick update on some of the vital medical assets that Maine CDC tracks on a daily basis. Overall, there are 398 intensive care unit beds across the state, 152 of which are available. There are 318 ventilators, of which 254 are available, and there remain available 441 alternative ventilators. This morning, Maine CDC closed an outbreak at the Oxford Street shelter after a total of 15 cases affiliated with that shelter had been detected. The closure of the Oxford Street shelter outbreak marks the second closing of a, of a shelter associated outbreak this week. After earlier in the week, Maine CDC closed its outbreak investigation into the Hope House shelter in Bangor. Overall, Maine CDC continues its work with some pending outbreaks. For example, at the Abbott facility, there are now a total of 25 cases associated with that facility. Maine CDC's outbreak investigation continues there. Similarly, at Nichols Manufacturing, where universal testing is underway, there are a total of seven cases. And at the Procter & Gamble Tambrands facility in Auburn, now a total of 13 cases. A quick update on the work that our colleagues at the National Guard are undertaking to, uh, to provide fit testing for healthcare workers across the state. Just today alone, the National Guard is fit testing approximately 25 staff members, primarily at the South Portland Nursing Home. By the end of today, this means that our colleagues at the Guard will have fit tested 2,264 healthcare workers across the state over um, almost 80 missions statewide. As always, they have more work ahead of them and nearly 250 additional healthcare workers on the docket to, to receive fit testing across the state. Just a few hours ago, Maine CDC was notified by the federal government that we would be receiving an additional shipment of remdesivir. Sometime early next week, we were informed that Maine CDC would be receiving five cases of remdesivir for use in healthcare facilities across the state. As soon as that shipment is received and distributed, I'll make sure we provide an update on that for everybody. And finally, before I turn things over to Governor Mills, a quick update on our testing. Cumulatively across the state, there have been now 71,000 Six, 764 tests for COVID-19 statewide. That's 71764. Of those tests, 67,376 have been the PCR test that tells us where we are in the current outbreak. Cumulatively, the positivity rate for all of the PCR tests done in Maine has been 4.63% continuing to, tr to trend downward. Just in the past 24 hours, there have been 1,434 1, PCR tests conducted in the state. That's 1434. Of those tests, 61 were positive for a day point positivity rate of 4.25%. The day long number fluctuates as you can tell every day. But what we look at is not just the day's number, but also the number over a seven day moving average. 
there too, our overall positivity rate has been trending in the right direction, as has the cumulative positivity rate. We still have more road ahead of us with respect to more testing and driving that positivity rate number as far down as we can, but the trends seem to be heading in our favor. So with that, Governor Mills, I'd like to turn things over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, for the update. If I understood you correctly, I'm quite distant from you. There were no additional deaths reported in the last 24 hours? Uh, that's correct, Governor. In fact, there have been no additional deaths reported in the last three days. That's terrific. And I think it says that what we're doing is working. Today's the 12th of, Jan of June, <laughs> 12th of June, and it seems like forever ago, but it was the 12th of March when Maine saw its first positive COVID test, COVID, COVID positive case. Uh, and it was right after that, that we first declared a state of civil emergency. And at that same time that week, the legislature um, brought to a close a lot of its work at that time, it enacted emergency legislation and a pared back supplemental budget and gave us the tools that we needed to fight this pandemic. And I'm pleased to to interpret these most recent results as at least a plateauing of the critical numbers that Dr. Shaw and his team have been monitoring from day one. Um, well, 50 odd cases is not a great number, not an not a optimistic number. Still, it's a leveling off, I think, if I understand correctly. You know, it's Friday the 12th of June, and I know this week there's been a lot of discussion about our, our revised plan, our Keep Maine Healthy plan that we announced in, in, on Monday uh, after distributing it pretty widely the week before and getting a lot of comments, pro and con. Uh, and we felt it was a good plan, a good compromise to avoid the 14, 14 day quarantine requirement on out of state visitors on the uh, eve of the influx of tourists that we generally see in June, July and August. And I think that plan is working even in this short period of time since Monday I'll tell you why. I get a lot of comments, pro and con, a lot of people with input, ideas they want to share, and that's great. We talk to legislators and business leaders and chambers of commerce and working groups all the time to get the most robust information we can before making any decisions on any level about any particular activity. This week, that decision was pretty hard. Last weekend, we all worked very uh, hard over the weekend discussing and brainstorming how we could protect Maine people, whether or not it would be wise to exempt New Hampshire residents and Vermont residents, looking at the data. And I think we made the right decisions. And today is the first day that New Hampshire and Vermont residents can come into Maine without quarantining and without a, a, a test, a, positive, a, a COVID-19 test. That test is required or the quarantine for people coming from all other parts of the country or, or out of off the uh, off country, out of country. In, a, in the wake of that announcement Monday, I just want to begin sharing a message that I got last night. This individual wrote us and said she gave us her permission to share this. Quote, my husband works in healthcare administration in Maryland, save for FaceTime. I haven't seen him since early March. We planned that he would drive from Maryland tomorrow, Friday, to Maine. So we were upset with Governor Mills' announcement on Monday and concerned that he wouldn't be, quote, let into the state. So he proactively took a COVID-19 test early Tuesday. He just learned two hours ago he's COVID positive. He is asymptomatic and he will take an antibody test later today, she wrote. She said, this was a clear shot across the bow for our family as we have an extended familial bubble that includes an immunocompromised family member, which may have led to devastating consequences. End quote. This plan is working. While this woman was initially frustrated with what she heard, like others, in the end, the fact that her husband got a test and discovered he was positive, even though he had no symptoms, that prevented him from spreading it to others, including family members who were immunocompromised. That's why my administration is working hard every day to put forward plans and make decisions and testing alternatives in this case that protect the health of Maine people and the people who work in the tourism industry 
and our visitors from other states to help them know and understand that Maine can be and is, to the best of our ability, a safe place to visit. I share the concerns about the economy. Clearly, as governor of this state, like my colleagues in all the other states, we are very concerned about the effects of this pandemic on our economies. But boy, I can think of nothing more devastating to our economy than an outbreak or a resurgence of this deadly and untreatable virus at the height of our tourism season. Nothing would be worse for our, for our economy and for the tourism industry in particular than that kind of an outbreak. So I want visitors, staff, employees, and members of the public to know that they will be protected by every means possible. I'm glad our plans are working and I'm glad I'm grateful to this family for sharing this important step and, and taking this step and sharing their history. Now I wanna turn it over to Heather Johnson, who's our esteemed uh, Commissioner of Economic and Community Development, someone with one of the toughest jobs in state government right now and who is doing yeoman's work every day. It's been three months since our first positive case in Maine. But it's been more than three months that these cabinet members and my staff have been working day and night every day, never taking a weekend off to help Maine make sure that Maine people are safe. So Commissioner, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Governor. Um, earlier today, the administration announced that we have accelerated the first day that lodging establishments in Maine can begin serving out-of-state visitors who have either met the 14-day requirement in Maine or the state's new testing alternative to Friday, June 26th. Accelerating the start date will open up a key weekend of Maine tourism season leading up to the July 4th holiday. Per the announcement on Maine, uh, per the announcement on Monday, residents of New Hampshire and Vermont who are exempt from Maine's 14-day quarantine and testing alternative are eligible to arrive today. Also as a reminder, the Maine Department of Health and Human Services announced earlier this week a new standing order and significantly expanded testing for people throughout Maine, including employees of Maine's tourism industry. According to data from the National Governors Association, more than half of the states no longer limit testing to people with symptoms or close contact who had COVID-19, while more than a dozen states allow anyone to be tested. We are pleased to join those states. Additionally, we have posted updates for stage two and stage three checklist for businesses and activities. With that, Dr. Shaw, I think it's time to open up to questions. Great, thank you, Governor Mills. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Uh, we'll turn over to our colleagues in the media and today's first question goes to Steve Missler from Maine Public. Oh, you guys caught me off guard there. Um, <clears throat> two, quick, uh, two quick questions, Dr. Shaw. Um, it sounds like this spike in cases of, uh, of 54 cases of, is a bit of a mystery at this point. Is that is that fair to say? Uh, well, I wouldn't I wouldn't characterize it as a mystery, Steve. We we get cases reported to us through the evening, uh, overnight, through the electronic laboratory system, and no matter what the number is, we begin the investigation process. So it's not so much a mystery as much as it is the normal process of getting cases in, reaching out to the individuals, beginning the contact tracing process. Okay, thanks. And another quick question for you before I direct the next one to um, either the governor or uh, Commissioner Johnson. One, uh, what is the R not at this point? Uh, what's our rebirth? Yeah, um, so uh, what Steve's referring to is a, a number that we look at in epidemiology uh, as, as we're going through an outbreak to get a sense of whether there are more cases occurring or fewer cases. Uh, to be just ever so slight, slightly technical for just a second, Steve, in the middle of an outbreak, the number that we calculate or look at is called RT as opposed to R naught, but that's just uh, that's neither here nor there. Based on where we are as of about 24 hours ago, our RT was a, a bit under one. It was probably about 0.97. Uh, we'll run the models with the latest numbers today. I don't expect that it will go much higher than that, maybe to 0.98 or 0.99, but we're, 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 we're a touch under one. Probably, I think uh, in the latest math, around 0.97. Okay, thank you. And I'm not sure which which who wants to answer this question, but it, it is related to this ask from the hospitality industry um, this morning um, for $800 million in um, CARES Act funding. 
For how, I'm sorry, how much? 800 million. 800 million, okay. Yeah. Um, and I guess what I'm wondering is, A, can the state use that money for that purpose? And B, I mean, and I ask that because I think New Hampshire is doing that. Um, and if, if it can, um, what's the, what is the objection to doing so? I don't believe that's addressed in the, in the release that you sent out earlier, Governor Mills. No, we didn't say we objected to any particular proposal. What we said was we're going to share these proposals, any of them, with our economic um, our recovery committee and with the appropriations committee and with other committees of jurisdiction in the legislature and have them look at these things. I certainly want legislative input into any such decisions. Um, and I've had several com communications and discussions with uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary of Treasury, Steve uh, Mnuchin, uh, and when members of Congress, our members of Congress, uh, about what the restrictions are right now, time period wise and language wise, what the current money can may be used for or might not be used for. Um, there's some indication that many towns and cities want some of that money to backfill some of their expenses due to COVID. Uh, and there's there are three or four bills in the, in the state, in the US Senate right now that would expand the uses of the money, the current money, and hopefully provide more funds for a stimulus package, which is what we're really talking about. The COVID-19 relief fund, the language of the bill says is to be used basically for COVID related expenses, not that not necessarily backfilling people's revenue losses, government or non-government. Um, so we're looking at the language and we're looking at legislative input and we're looking to Congress to clarify some of the uses of that money and give us better guidance and uh, hopefully a more fuller, more robust stimulus package. As you know from the letter that um, I sent to the congressional delegation about three weeks ago, we uh, tried to put together estimates from um, all sectors of the economy in Maine and we, we were looking at as much as $3 billion in relief for the agricultural sector, for the fisheries, for municipal governments, for economic losses to the tourism industry, all those things are uh, uh, in, in that package, in that letter that we, we sent to Congress. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Steve. Uh, we'll turn next to Jessica Piper from the BDN. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Um, first, I wanted to touch on whoever can answer this. Um, We've been getting a lot of questions about how this testing for out-of-staters is going to work in practice. Um, for instance, if a person gets a test, but it takes them more than 72 hours to get results, is that then for naught? And what general recommendations can you give to people who are trying to figure out how to get a test so they can come to Maine? Well, yeah, I think every state has mapped out their testing sites. Honestly, I, and I talked with the governors of um, uh, New Hampshire and Vermont several times recently, they've been expressing frustration, um, although they're exempt from our, our guidance, but they've been expressing frustration about not getting, not convincing people to do the tests. I don't know why you wouldn't if it was available and you did want to travel wherever and for how, however long. It, it's a wise thing to do. And I think the, 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 um, the story I just recited from that communication, the woman whose husband was in Maryland, demonstrates why it's important. Every state now has a number of testing sites and many of them have the sort of CVS drive-through, drive-up and swab and send facilities and uh, all those things uh, to a larger extent than we do actually. Uh, in New York and Massachusetts have expansive testing sites because the federal government focused on the hotspots, the 12 hotspots, including Massachusetts, Connecticut uh, and New York and New Jersey in distributing the reagents and the test materials uh, several weeks ago. So they've stood up these testing sites and I don't know that there'd be serious difficulty in getting those. And the federal government has also allowed that Medicare, Medicaid uh, and private insurance should pay for any expenses due to the, uh, as a result of the test or from the test itself. Uh, and we've done that in Maine too, provided that uh, most of the tests are paid for somehow or other. So those, barriers shouldn't be terribly over, uh, difficult to overcome. I think where people are, are running into issues though is potentially the length of time it takes them to get results from a test. So some of these drive-through sites, Same. it takes, they're saying, you know, three to five days to yeah. get a response and then 
you know, the 72 hour window has passed. So what, what are people supposed to do in that situation? Yeah, and Dr. Shaw can answer that too, but what we're suggesting is when there's a lag time that people stay pretty much quarantined or isolated, not exposed to other people as much as possible during that wait time. But Dr. Shaw, maybe you can add to that. Sure, Jessica. Thank you, Governor. There, there is variance in the amount of time that some laboratories take to return test results. Some of the larger national laboratories may take several days. That being said, more uh, local or state-based laboratories, such as our laboratory in Augusta, are able to return results within 24 hours. We recommend that anyone who's planning on coming to Maine and looking to get that test, check with the provider who's offering the test before they enlist and sign up to make sure that they can get results back within 24, 48, or 72 hours to allow them sufficient time to travel to Maine. There is variance in there, but it's always worth checking before they get that test done to make sure they'll get the results back in due time. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. And then the other question I had was about the hospital use data that you guys have been putting out daily. It looks like today there was no increase in cumulative hospitalizations, but there was an increase in current hospitalizations. Does that mean people are being released from the hospital and then readmitted? Or is there something else going on? Uh, no, so uh, it's a good question, Jessica. What's, what's kind of going on there is a couple of things. The cumulative hospitalization data is the result of looking back and talking to folks as our case investigators and contact tracers make contact with folks. Occasionally we find that someone may have spent the night in the hospital uh, a week or two or three weeks ago as we talk to them more and more. The other thing we often find is an individual may have been in the ER for a period of time and the hospital may have counted it as a hospitalization if they were there past midnight, but in our numbers, it may not reflect that. So there is a little bit of a variance between the two and that's always the case in any outbreak situation. It reflects the fact that as we go back talk to folks, learn about whether they were actually admitted or just in the ER. For example, we learn more about the proper nuances. All right, thank you. And we are going to turn to Emily Tadlock at WABI next. Emily, are you, uh, are you on right now? We'll check back in with Emily in a moment and turn to Kevin Miller at the Press Herald. Great, thank you very much. Um, this, I guess, first kind of question for either uh, Governor Mills or for, for Commissioner Johnson. You know, can you talk just a little bit more about, you know, the, the reason behind bumping up that timeline? So only a couple of days, but, you know, is that really because you were seeing these the downward trends in numbers or was this, you know, uh, obviously you're getting a lot of pressure from the hospitality industry to to allow them to cater to more out of, out of state visitors. Can you just, I guess, elaborate a little bit more on the reason for, for bumping that up? Yeah, can I yeah. just, well, just it gives them more than a couple of days. It gives them two additional weekends. Uh, June 26 is on a Friday. So that weekend of June 26, 27, 28 is added plus that whole week leading up to the weekend of uh, July 4th. So this, it, it gives the industry substantial, fairly substantial amount of time additional to what they had before. But also it's a balancing, as you sort of imply in your question, it's a balancing of the public health, public health priorities of da the data, where we see that going, and the need to support the economy to the, to the uh, extent possible under the circumstances. Yeah. Commissioner Johnson, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I mean, I think this we've we've always known that this was an incredibly important week as part of the tourism season, um, and so you know it's been on the table for discussion and and look. But to your point, the numbers um, seem to be holding pretty well. It looks like testing is loosening up in some of these other places, and so it was something that we we were able to to move forward. So that's there's a number of factors, as the governor indicated. We, we are also continuing continuing to encourage Maine people to do staycations and to go to places in Maine and enjoy the Maine uh, outdoors and support the Maine economy as best they can to support our local businesses. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Great. Uh, uh, Dr. Shaw, just a quick question for you as well. 
Yeah, sure. Um, on, on kind of following up on the discussion of the 54 cases, is there, I mean, can you tell us any, any more about where those are located? I, I was trying to look at the county data and um, I mean, are these mostly in Penobscot or, or in Cumberland and, and York counties? Um, and do you have any, any additional insights as to what might be going on there? Yeah, uh, Kevin, that, that investigation is literally underway as we speak. Uh, as, as I noted with Steve, um, when we get new cases in, our EPI team fires up its machinery, begins their detective work. Um, most of the cases that we've seen just in the last 24 hours are in the counties of primary community transmission, principally Cumberland, Androscoggin, to a lesser extent, York County. But the specific epidemiology behind them, that's what our investigators are working on right now and trying to get a better handle of. Uh, we'll probably have a lot better information and a lot better handle as that investigation continues through the weekend and into next week. Okay, great, thank you. You bet. Um, before I, I'm gonna, we're gonna turn back to Emily Tadlock if she's on. And Emily, while you're while you're logging in or while you're getting your audio on, I, I want to turn back to uh, Jessica Piper's question for a bit uh, about the 72-hour point. Um, Jessica, one of the Perhaps the question behind your question is why the 72 hours is important and why we chose that as the margin or the window. Um, the, 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 the reality there is that if you go beyond seven, much beyond 72 hours into four days, five days, after someone gets tested, there's a possibility that they could become exposed to the virus after they get tested in their other state. And thus, the, the entire value, the entire supposition of having a negative test before you come to Maine gets erased. For example, the, the gentleman that Governor Mills noted, if he had been tested not right before he started his journey to Maine, but two or three weeks ago, he might have tested negative. But as we know now, because he, start, he got tested right before he, he started his journey to Maine, he tested positive and potentially avoided infecting members of his family, some of whom we know to be immunocompromised. So that 72 hours is important because it's the length of time before someone can arrive here and it preserves their ability to come here and gives us security in knowing that the negative test really is a negative because not so much time has elapsed to allow someone to get exposed and become infected. Uh, Emily, uh, are you back on? All right, we're gonna turn next to Amy Brown at WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, first question for you, are you concerned that Maine may be soon seeing the spike in cases that's being seen in several other states that are in the process of reopening? Or do you think enough people are following the CDC guidelines and the governor's recommendations so that we'll be able to avoid that? Uh, so Amy, the answer is that it's both. Uh, we are always concerned and on the lookout for any uptick in cases. As you noted, there have been a number of states, principally right now, Arizona, North Carolina, Florida, uh, among others, that have seen significant increase in cases just in the past couple of days over the past couple of weeks. Thankfully, Maine has not been among those, but we remain concerned and vigilant for that possibility. That's why we take a look at the data every single day and look not just for trends in the number of cases, but also other indicators that are independent of testing, such as hospitalization rates. The other, the other thing that you noted is simultaneously true as well. There's been widespread use of face coverings across the state. There's been folks who continue to maintain physical distance even as they resume social interactions. So it's actually a combination of both, Amy. I personally have been proud of the way that I've seen folks across the state of Maine put those face coverings on, maintain that physical distance, while at the same time we remain vigilant and on the lookout for the possibility of cases. Let's of course hope we don't see that, but as we've said multiple times, in the middle of an outbreak, hope is not a strategy. We still urge folks to wear those face coverings, to maintain that physical distance, to keep adhering to hygiene, hand washing guidelines. Thank you. And for both, I think the governor and yourself, if you'd like to weigh in, Dr. Shah, would either of you encourage voting by mail as a safer alternative to going to the polls this year, given what was seen recently in states in the South? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. And I have talked to the Secretary of State, Matt Dunlap, a number of times, and uh, we, uh, we are uh, 
allied in that respect that we all want to we all want to encourage absentee voting or vote by mail, uh, which means as of this week, you can request uh, an absentee ballot, call the town clerk or send a card, um, request an absentee ballot be sent you. You can hang on to it. You can turn, return it immediately or you can wait to fill it out and you can fill it out and return it up to 8 p.m. on election day itself. Just make sure it gets there before the polls close on election day. We have opened up that that uh, avenue uh, substantially in various executive orders because as you know, we have poll watchers and poll clerks, uh, people who work, the, who volunteer on election day who may have vulnerable conditions, maybe an older group of people, maybe may have underlying medical conditions. We don't wanna put them at risk. And we don't want to put the general public at risk. Um, and so we want to have a good turnout on election day, July 14th. Uh, and we want to preserve the right to vote in person if we possibly can, but the right to vote in any respect, including uh, voting in, uh, by absentee ballot. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. We'll turn next to Bob Evans at News Center. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Shaw, the number of cases in York County have continued to drop recently. What is the threshold or just how low do those numbers need to go to make it safe for businesses in those three counties to fully open? And could York County uh, businesses open sooner? <laughs> I'm happy to start and then of course, turn it over to the governor and commissioner. Um, the, the, the bottom line there, Bob, is that those discussions are very much underway right now. What we are always trying to balance is making sure that any move towards reopening doesn't invite the possibility of more cases. Uh, although the number of cases in York County has dropped and it's continued to be at a steadily low number, that's because of the great work of the people of York County in staying distant from one another, keeping space from one person to another on the beach, so on and so forth. As we think about reopening, we wanna make sure that we can keep those numbers low. Uh, those discussions, again, are very much underway right now. Um, and I will turn things over to either the governor or Commissioner Johnson to pick up from there. Right. Well, I'll just add, we talk about this every day and we look at uh, when we get them, as soon as we get that data, county by county, where are things going? Is there an outbreak? As there has been in Androscoggin County just this week, outbreaks in the private sector and workplaces and whatnot and group homes. I mean, we had three outbreaks in one 48-hour period a week and a half or so ago in Androscoggin County, which led us to take some pretty uh, drastic action in postponing the opening of indoor dining in that county. Uh, York and Cumberland continue to change. We're looking at it, obviously, from a public health point of view. And as Dr. Shaw has said several times, you look at the kind of activity we're looking at uh, with input from the industry and input from public health professionals the duration of your presence there, the <clears throat> excuse me, the density, <coughs> density of the area and the population, the gathering, the uh, duration and density, uh, and uh, how close you are, <clears throat> and whether it's indoors or outdoors. Indoor dining, by definition, is indoors. So, it's a pretty, um, it's a difficult thing to gauge. But we are looking at it every day, hoping to be able to revive the economy of those counties and those particular sectors of the uh, of the tourism industry and, and allow visitors to go there and have uh, and dine inside. I'll okay, just add on top of that, Bob, the numbers are low. Our goal is to keep them that way while simultaneously resuming economic activity. We look not just at the number of cases, but a number of other variables as well, such as the number of hospitalizations in York County, the number of those hospitalizations that are in intensive care units, a number of parameters that we think about, not just the number of cases. Mr. Johnson, did you want to weigh in on that at all? No, and just I think also, right, we talk a lot um, on this briefing, particularly about public health, because this is the CDC brief daily briefing. Um, certainly there is clear acknowledgement of the the economic challenges as well, and really the the integration of public health and economic health and well-being. And, and those need to continue to move um, together. And to Dr. Shaw's point, we we look at that on an ongoing basis, recognizing that that there is some criticality and urgency on the economic side as well. Speaking of York County, 
I have a package because I haven't seen Dr. Shah in person for some some time, but I got a package in the mail at the at the, at the Capitol yesterday, addressed to Dr. Shah, and it's from a York County business, um, Divine Chocolates in Cape Netic on Route One. This pack it's very heavy too. It's a couple pounds of chocolate. I assume it's chocolate. This is waiting for you, Dr. Shah. When next we meet. Uh, well, thank you, Governor. Please rest assured that it will be eaten and eaten very quickly in our household. Uh, <laughs> I will turn next to Megan from WMTW. Thank you for taking my question. It's about uh, the number of recoveries that we've seen. Earlier in the week, we had a day where we saw about 100, which was in part due to the uh, a lot of people recovering from outbreaks. But the past two days have been pretty significant as well. We had 40 on the last 24 hours, and before that it was 30 something. So um, those numbers seem rather encouraging um, and as you've said, we're going in the right direction. So my question really is, why would you attribute this kind of um, good recovery rate to? Does it have anything to do with the use of remdesivir or um, what else would you attribute that to? Sure. Um, so uh, Megan, you're correct on the numbers. We've seen just in the past few days now about 180 individuals who have recovered. Um, it, it's not directly attributable to remdesivir uh, much of it is attributable to the fact that many of the individuals across the state of Maine who have become ill have thankfully sought medical assistance, have not required hospitalizations, and have been following their doctor's orders, taking good care of themselves, not infecting others, making sure they're getting a lot of fluids. All the things that we know are good for almost any viral respiratory illness happen to be good for COVID-19 as well. This is a positive sign though. It is a sign that as with many viral respiratory illnesses, recovery from COVID-19 is possible. Uh, those signs are encouraging, but we simultaneously are making sure that we're on the lookout for concerning signs. Uh, for example, other individuals who may be in the hospital, who may be on ventilators. What we've really seen with COVID-19 is a bit of a divergence. Individuals who are generally younger, seem to do well with it. But uh, as with any viral disease, in fact, as with any disease, individuals who are older, who require hospitalization or ventilation tend to, tend to fare poorly. Uh, that's one reason why COVID-19 is of such concern from a public health perspective, because for those who may be older, who though, for those who may have pre-existing conditions, the, unfortunately, the, the percentage of those individuals who require hospitalization and who pass away is, is strikingly high. I'm going to turn now to David Horowitz at ABC7. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shaw. I just had a question. When the state <laughs> reopen, are you expecting a spike in numbers or do you think it'll be as it has been so far? Well. When you say reopen, may I, maybe I could ask you to clarify, because we've had a gradual restarting the economy plan in, in place for now a month and a half, uh, and it's been gradual, it's been steps, and uh, I guess your question, the answer to your question may depend on which steps you're talking about, but also we've said repeatedly we're continuing to monitor the epidemiolo epidemiological data day by day in response to the to various economic moves in various parts of the state. Okay, yeah, no, I was just meant in general when the state begins to reopen in all phases. I think Dr. Shah uh, competently con contrasted uh, us with some other states. We're seeing in the new national news, 19 states where there's uh, suddenly resurgence. And many of those states uh, are states where they quote reopened not gradually, but um, rather dramatically, with with very few restrictions in place. So we try to be very be very careful about that. Uh, uh, the only thing I'll add, David, is that uh, re reopening is not a binary thing. It's not off one day and then on the next day. It's a stepwise process. And as we move forward, there's always the possibility that we may have to take a step back. Thankfully, we haven't seen the concerning spikes that Arizona, North Carolina, Florida have seen, but we are continuing to be on the lookout for them as we continue to turn the dial. Um, reopening is not a singular phenomenon. It occurs in phases 
as it has already been. I, uh, I understand that Emily Tadlock has been on the line. So Emily, uh, today's last question goes to you. Last call for anything from Emily. Okay, well, uh, Governor, Hi, Commissioner. can you hear me? Oh, oh really? yes, you just sneaked in in the, in okay. the, in the nick of time. Oh. <laughs> oh my goodness, as you all know by now, technology is great until it isn't. So uh, <laughs> I'm on now and I'm gonna ask that question. We were listening in on the Health and Human Services Committee meeting of the legislature this morning, and some of the representatives were expressing concerns about how some nursing homes and hospitals, especially in, especially in rural areas, have not received funding from the state and um, are worried about making ends meet at this point. And they're also worried about some of their uh, PPE reserves um, and not having enough. So I don't know if you guys wanna kind of address that. I can in part maybe, this is Governor Mills, I get uh, at least weekly, if not more frequently, uh, updates from uh, the White House about the PPE that is delivered directly to nursing homes. Often enough, and it looks, it looks like every nursing home in the state of Maine is getting p substantial quantities of PPE from the federal government directly, not through us, although some through us as well. Um, and some of those are, some of, sometimes it says pending shipment, which means they haven't got it yet. Uh, but I'm happy to follow up with any particular uh, nursing homes that don't feel they have an adequate supply of PPE at this time. Um, I, I don't know how Jean may have answered the question this morning, so I don't want to usurp her expertise in that area either. But mm -hmm. and, and Emily, I would, on the former, with respect to financing, refer you to Commissioner Lambrey's comments uh, before the committee this morning with respect to PPE on top of what Governor Mills noted. Uh, any nursing home that feels that their stocks of PPE have been running low or they feel like they are in jeopardy of running out of PPE, we recommend uh, that they follow the same process that uh, facilities across the state have followed since we began our activation, which is to make a request with their County Emergency Management Association. The county EMAs route those immediately to Maine Emergency Management and Maine CDC, and we load up the boxes and put them on the trucks. As folks have heard who have been tuning into these briefings now for a few months, we've delivered now more than 2,100 shipments of PPE the predominance of which have gone directly to long-term care facilities across the state. Those shipments now comprise over 1.5 million pieces of PPE. It's one, that's one piece of PPE, more than one piece of PPE for every single person in Maine. If there are facilities out there that are concerned about their stockpiles, especially if they are concerned about an outbreak in the offing, we recommend they contact their emergency management agency, and then they can be on the list for further shipments. Uh, Governor Mills, that was the last question. I'll turn things back over to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Shaw, once again. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. You know, I, I don't think people understand necessarily um, what Commissioner Johnson's role is, for instance, and uh, the role of so many other cabinet members who have worked uh, day in and day out uh, trying to keep people safe in this time of uh, dangerous and unprecedented pandemic. I just want to let, let people know that Commissioner Johnson came to us a year and a half ago um, and I was delighted to hire her for this job. She came to us with more than 25 years of experience in the private sector and the public sector with worldwide uh, uh, companies like Nokia, uh, Gateway uh, and others. She had substantial national and international business experience before she took this job. Came back to Maine, she's a Somerset County, Western Maine gal as am I but she's Somerset, I'm Franklin. But um, she brought that experience to bear on her job, her responsibilities as Commissioner of uh, Economic and Community Development. And I'm so proud of her, so pleased that we made that hire. She was also Executive Director of the Somerset Economic Development Corporation and Head of Connect Me Authority, um, learning all, all there is to know about broadband. Her wealth of experience and her ability to articulate uh, day to day, the decisions and the discussions we're having are an enormous resource for me and for the people of Maine. And I want to publicly thank her. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Uh, thank you, Governor. It's certainly uh, an honor to be part of the administration in this really difficult time as we try to 
continue to find that balance between public health and economic health and, and appreciate being part of this team. Great. Well, thank you all so much uh, for joining this afternoon. I hope everyone has a great weekend. As always, please be kind and take care of one another. Thank you all so much. We'll talk soon. Thank you.